came from the 508 and 508 Red present Beneath the Red Umbrella. Hopelessness. We have all, at times, felt hope fade into an empty void. But do we truly know that emptiness? Do any of us know what it is to know there is no hope? Do any of us know what it means when no help is coming? Do you know hopelessness? Let's find out. Gladys Birch walked through the double doors of the lone station for the Glastonbury, Connecticut Police Department in no different way than she had every night for the last 13 years. Her slender frame, clad in the shades of gray and blue of her uniform, slunk reluctantly toward the briefing room. She sipped coffee from her giant travel mug as she mentally prepared for Captain Maynard's nightly duty roster, though the patch on her shoulder read Dispatcher offered her no surprises. Every night of those 13 years had been exactly the same. Occasionally, Officer Dukes would drag in a drunk he pulled over, turning off the interstate. Officer Blake caught the sporadic teenager when breaking up a party at the old Crawford mine, and rarely they had an event as extreme as a shoplifter being brought in from the local strip mall. Gladys's life at the Glastonbury PD was an endless chain of silence, broken up by hourly patrol check-ins. The lone person connecting three cars for 12 hours a night, four nights a week, for 13 very long years. Gladys entered the briefing room as the captain was taking the podium to issue the nightly jobs. She sat in her seat, the same seat she had sat in since February 8th, 1970, and waited to hear that same old song. Burge, dispatch. Captain Maynard threw the orders out of his mouth lazily, as if he and Gladys both knew they'd just as soon get it over with. Gladys nodded to the captain, and he continued. Duke, Duncan, Speed Trap, Blake, Rogers, Patrol, Sanders, O'Hare. The captain rattled the rest of the orders off in short order. This was just a formality. Everyone knew what they were doing. Gladys stood up with her fellow officers as they had a thousand times to head to their stations. When they heard the captain call out, Oh, and? The room full of bored cops stood at attention, looking back to their captain with heightened surprise. Oh, and? There was never an O and. I'd like two of you to go over to the clinic. Day shift reported a few incidents over there. Some bug going around, I guess. Just poke your head around and make sure everything's all right, okay? The patrol officers all shouted in unison, a symphony of lethargic public servants chomping at the bit like starving Pomeranians. But Sanders was just a tiny bit quicker. Something new to do can never be wasted in a town this small. The captain looked up from his podium and nodded approvingly. Good man. Okay, people, let's get it done. The procession of gray and blue flooded out of the briefing room, and Gladys made her way to her desk in the dead center of the bullpen. The large room was filled with disheveled old desks. Most were left unused, the rime of dust on their surfaces a testament to the decade of downsizing the department had suffered. A visible eulogy for a dying, tiny town. 
Even the station television was a black and white relic from better days. Busier days before the mines dried up for good. She arrived at her desk, tore the sheet that read November 3rd, 1983 from her pocket calendar, and rested her giant mug on the counter next to her microphone. Her desk was adorned with rows and rows of nicks and knacks a constant visual stimulus to beat back the ever-encroaching calamity of death by boredom. She slid into her chair and clipped the microphone to the on position. Dispatch, checking in. Patrol 1, Sanders and O'Hare, checking in. Gonna follow up at the clinic and then circle back around to Beach Street. Trap 1, dude from Duncan checking in. Not a goddamn car, let alone a speeder. Patrol 2, Blake and Rogers checking in. Crop is all quiet. You know where I am if you need me, boys. The captain walked up to Gladys and leaned on the counter of her desk. He scratched his scruffy beard in the same bored manner he delivered the nightly duties. How's it going out there? Patrol 1 is heading to the clinic, but all quiet on the western front otherwise, boss. The captain nodded approvingly and strolled back to his office, calling out to Gladys in monotone apathy. Good movie, Birch. Carry on. Gladys sipped from her mug and prepared to lean into a new book titled The End of Life as We Know It by Dr. Andrea Krober. She scoffed as she eyed her empty surroundings. I think I'm already there, Doc. Dispatch, checking in. Troll 2, checking in. All clear. Traffic 1, checking in. No change. The radio fell silent. Patrol 1 did not check in. Gladys Birch, in her 13 years at the Glastonbury Police Department, had never had a failed check-in. She rose from her chair. Tinges of panic crept into her mind. She cleared her throat and grabbed the microphone. Patrol 1? Patrol 1, check in. Over. The microphone remained silent. Gladys called out again, with great urgency. Patrol 1, repeat, check in, over. The captain overheard her pleading into the microphone and slowly walked toward her desk. Birch, what's going on? She looked back to the captain with fright in her eyes and quickly called into the microphone one more time. Patrol 1, Sanders, O'Hare, check in, over. The silence filled the room. It became deafening. Gladys and Captain Maynard exchanged panic glances. The lack of sound coming from the microphone became suffocating. The panic in their exchanged breaths filled their ears. They stared intently as Gladys reached for the microphone. Officer down! I repeat, officer down! Requesting backup at Rothorn Clinic! Over! Gladys froze in terror, shaking in place. Captain Maynard pushed past her and grabbed the microphone. Hold on, Sanders. Backup is on the way. Captain Maynard stormed towards his office. Gladys could hear a shotgun being loaded as he called out to Birch, her. Birch! Call all patrols, Hawthorne Clinic. I'll meet them there. Gladys grabbed the microphone with both hands, shaking as she yelled in desperation. All post bulletin. I repeat, all post bulletin. All post report to Hawthorne Clinic. Over. Yep, yep, 10-4. Captain Maynard emerged from his office wearing a black bomber jacket with Glastonbury PD embroidered on the back and carried a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun. He grabbed one of the handheld two-ray radios next to Gladys and turned to leave. Listen, good, Birch. You hold down the fort here, I'll be back. He turned to leave before finishing. His final words fell heavy on Gladys, as if the responsibility would crush her. You stay on that radio. The captain stormed out of the large double doors. Gladys stared at the microphone, shell-shocked as the last five minutes played back in her mind. What could possibly happen? They won't fall! They won't fall! Sanders screamed into the microphone as more gunshots sounded loudly. The ungodly screeches grew louder and louder as the bullets exited the gun. Sanders fired more shots that shattered the sound barrier. A final, deafening scream broke in an all-out roar. Gladys winced as it engulfed all other sound. And then, all fell quiet all except for the sounds of something wet, something tearing, the sounds of something chewing, 
Gladys stumbled backward from her desk in sheer terror. Sanders choked out one final sentence. <laughs> Gladys bounded forward toward the microphone. Her hands shook as she jammed the button into the speaker phone. All post mode. bulletin. Repeat all post bulletin. Can anyone hear me? Sanders down. Use extreme caution approaching Hawthorne Clinic. No one responded. The radio remained silent. All fell silent. Gladys sat there, stunned in place in her chair, too engulfed with fear to move. In the far distance, outside, she could hear something faintly erupt, like the soft cracking of a handful of potato chips crunching in your mouth. Gladys began to look toward the window for the source. Sarge! Gladys ran full force from the window to the mic, her heart beating in her chest like a bass I'm here, drum. Cap. What's the situation? The situation is foobar, Burge. Patrol 1 and 2 are down. Multiple officers are down. Dukes and Duncan are wounded. We're doubling back to you on foot. Call the state troopers. Fuck, call the National Guard. We're overrun. What is attacking you? What do I tell them is happening? It's the town. It's the town. Captain. Captain. Gladys changed channels on the radio frantically. She called out to anyone who would possibly listen. Mayday, mayday. This is the Glastonbury Police Department. We are in a state of emergency. Multiple officers down. Please respond. The radio stayed silent. Not even the hum of a replaying channel rung out. Gladys repeated her call. Mayday! Mayday! This is the Glastonbury Police Department. We are in a state of emergency. Please! Gladys sat in her chair and rocked in place, trying to steady herself, trying not to let the fear take her over. She walked over to the sad, ancient television in the bullpen and turned it on. She flipped through the channels, but none worked. The only thing that spoke to her was the humming static of a flickering white screen as if the world outside had suddenly stopped. Then, finally, a solitary channel appeared. I repeat, incidents of extreme violence are being recorded across the country. Most normal channels of communication are down. If you are still seeing this broadcast, do not leave your homes. Do not let anyone into your home. Barricade and lock your doors, and may God help us all. Fuck this. Gladys sprung into action. She opened the dusty cage that held their heavy firepower. She grabbed a shotgun from the back wall and loaded it, cocking it with a determined pump. She attached a flashlight to the barrel and kicked open the double doors to the station, walking toward the last cruiser left in the parking lot. She stopped after three steps. Gladys could hear them, whispering in the dark surrounding the station. She could feel the eyes of a hundred terrible things watching her in the black void of night engulfing the parking lot. She heard growling well up among the murmurs in the blackness. Then she saw it. Gladys waved her flashlight in the cold night as snow began to grace the ground around her. She stopped at the lonely police cruiser, flashing the light at the man leaning against it, holding up a white umbrella. An umbrella the drip red with every white flake that landed and melted upon it. The man raised a single cold white finger to his lips. Gladys heard the whispering in the dark begin to circle her. She realized she wasn't just being watched. She was being hunted. In a burst of terror, Gladys retreated back inside and cut the overhead lights in the entire station. She dragged several of the unused desks and jammed them against the double doors to the bullpen, stacking them back to back against each other in a makeshift phalanx to protect against the growls echoing closer and closer in the night. As Gladys put the finishing touches on her makeshift barrier, a sound crept from inside the microphone, and she slowly walked toward it. Gladys. <laughs> Gladys, come in. In 13 years, the captain had never used her first name. She choked back tears as she replied. He sounded like he was dying, and she knew it. Yes, captain. 
Don't you come back? How? How do you come back? Let's say it again, Captain. <laughs> I shot him, Gladys. I shot him dead in the chest. He just got back up. <laughs> Let me roll good. I think. I think. Yeah, Captain. <laughs> Gladys rose from her seat and returned to the double doors. She raised her shotgun slowly. She pointed at the heaving double doors, buckling more and more with each massive noise. She aimed it intently as she drew closer, focusing her flashlight on the buckling aperture. The door exploded open, sending it careening into her makeshift barricade, and the unholy screaming began again. The noise overwhelmed Gladys, and she tripped backwards, misfiring her weapon into the dark, as the barricade crashed down on top of her, trapping her. In the muzzle flash, she saw them. Their black, unblinking eyes stared her down in the bursts of light from each pull of the trigger. The town, the entire town, coming for the last scrap of living meat left. Her fellow officers, their gray and blues now stained with streaks of deep crimson, slunk toward Gladys with hunger in their cold, dead, black eyes. As the dead town began to feed, the television gave one final transmission before cutting out forever. Ladies and gentlemen, the reports are true. The dead walk.